journey through the book of 2 Peter. And the reason I, that, that I, we are doing this, and the reason we are going through 2 Peter, is I really honestly believe that, and the, and the title today just makes, makes total sense. How many of you sleep um, with, let's go, the, let's go heavy first. How many of you sleep with a loaded gun? Okay, there's one. All right, uh, two. Uh, how many of you sleep with the alarm system on? Okay, you have a house, you have an alarm system, okay? How many of you sleep with the doors locked? Just about every person in the room. Okay, and the dog. And, and some of you sleep with a, a Rottweiler or some kind of a train kill attack dog. Now, um, my wife sleeps with a with a uh, loaded weapon ready to kill at all times, and that is me. Um, she don't, she needs no door lock, no alarms, no pistol or anything like that. She has me. Uh, my hands are registered with the federal government as instruments of death. Um, now, seriously, every single noise that's made, whether it be outside or inside, this is what I get. Wake up! I hear a noise. And see, that, that, that call, and, I, and I'm one of these people, I sleep hard. I sleep deep. I'm a heavy sleeper. Let me tell you, just advice. If she has to go, wake up, it better be a good reason. Because <laughs> I am awake, ready to kill. That's my attitude. I just come away and I, I don't come up with a bat with a, what's going on, honey? I'm like, what is it? You know, and I'm ready to go. And, uh, and uh, listen, this is, I'm not listening. Uh, this is the thing. This is the thing. The church, I really believe, it's, and I specifically am talking to this church, I really believe it's time that some of our families got hit in the side and told, wake up. Wake up. Because I really believe that a lot of us are snoozing. And what's, what's going to happen and what will happen is you're going to be two, I think there's a multiplicity of things, but one of the things that will happen is someone will come into your life and they will lead you astray. Someone can come in and say, you know, Jesus is this or Jesus is that. And you're going to go, oh, okay, that makes sense. Or someone's going to come in and, and, and shape the world when it comes to your belief system. Or, I really believe that you can be lulled to sleep by just attending church, hearing preaching after preaching after preaching, and your spiritual life will just fade into what I call nominalism. Kind of like, eh, whatever. No big deal. Church, Disney, eh, they're the same. They both bring me happiness on certain days. And see, I think what has happened in our culture, in our country, if we are, I think I'm almost more fearful of nominalism in the sense that it just becomes boring. It's just, it's just easy. And then what happens is, this is why I've seen this pattern over and over again. A trial will hit your life, and the pastor's not there, and you'll go save people, or a friend is not there. Ah, I don't need them. And then you become bitter. Or the church let me down. So let's go find another church. So we go shopping for churches and we find another one with all our hopes and all our we find other friends with all our hopes and then another trial hits our life. And guess what? The same thing happens. Over and over and over again. Where I really believe the problem lies is not necessarily people. People are people. They're not God. And the church is a church. It's the body of Christ. I believe, I, 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 I support it, I love it, I, 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 I love it, you know, because I believe it's, it's the body of Christ. But listen, your foundation, 
Your, your foundation has to be in Jesus Christ. But you have to build on that foundation every single day in the Word of God. You need to be reading the Word of God. You need to be memorizing the Word of God. You need to be studying the Word of God. And I can tell you in about five seconds in a trial, just reading Facebook. I can read Facebook in one day and go, yeah, trial, no, no grounding. Yep, spewing and vomiting all over everybody. Nope, there's no foundation, no building on that foundation. No word of God. See, Peter is talking about that. He is saying in this scripture, wake up to God's word. Wake up to God's word. Many of us are heavy sleepers. And we're just waiting until that moment. And then everything will come down. All will be shattered. I've seen families. I saw, I saw one man of God get to, you know, be, be basically in a situation where his family was in desperate and dire need. And then the next thing he knows, he's lost his job. They're already in need. Then they lose their job. And then I did, I did it, it just incredibly, I saw the foundation. They, that man had built on the foundation of Christ and had built on that foundation a life of studying the Scripture and turning to the Scripture and reading the Scripture and leading his family in that direction. And you see the stability. And you see the weather and the storm. And I've seen just the opposite. Peter is saying, we need security. We need security from false teaching and we need security from difficult times. And where do we turn for that, strength, that, that, that security? The Word of God. The first point here that I want to talk about is, and I'm going to read this, is Peter talks about men will die but the word of God lives forever. Listen to this. I love this. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. We're going to finish up chapter 1 today, and we'll be like, you know, obviously we'll be in chapter 2 next week. But therefore, I will always remind you about these things, Peter says. Even though you know them and are established in the truth you have. See, Peter's saying, I'm not talking to a bunch of people who are not Christ followers. He is talking to the, the, the men and women of God who are already followers of the faith. They're already believers. I consider it right as long as I am in this tent. He's saying, as long as I live. You know, have you ever thought about this about Peter? From the moment Peter talks with Jesus at the, at the, at the breakfast that they have after the crucifixion when Jesus reveals himself to them again he's cooking breakfast for them and he stands up there. You know he basically tells Peter for the rest of your life till you're old you're in work. Did you know Peter's laying in jail just right after Pentecost and they're going we're going to kill you? He's probably laying in the bed going I'll believe that when I see it. He goes, I know when I'm done. When God's done. Peter, he, he, you, couldn't, you couldn't threaten him with that. He goes, you know, I'm probably going to be really old. Because Jesus said you're going to be really old. They're going to gird you. They're going to pick you up. They're going to put you on a cross. And they're going to crucify you. They're going to bind you when you're in your age. And one he was interested about was John. Because Jesus said, hey, that guy's been that one, you know, a long time. But you think about Paul, Peter, James. James is the first disciple to die. You think about these guys. <laughs> you know, we had this little discussion this morning. I don't think these guys were thinking the concept, okay, now I can take a gun and I'll go like this. No. They wouldn't have done that because their foundation was in Christ Jesus and their purpose was to spread the gospel. But Peter says, I will soon lay aside my tent as the Lord Jesus 
Christ has all so shown me. And he says, and I will make every effort that after my departure, I love this, you may be able to recall these things at any time. See, Peter's saying, my influence upon Mark has given you the gospel of Mark. He's my disciple. My influence upon other, other gospel writers has given you other, the other gospels. See, Mark was the, did you know, some people don't realize this, did you know Mark was the original gospel text that was written and was used by both Luke and Matthew as a guideline to the writing of their gospels? And then you have 1st and 2nd Peter. Both, both books, both letters that, that, that were going to be, that are part of the canon, that were inspired by God. And he says, you know what? I'm going to die. But the written word will be there for you that you can recall anytime. Anytime. The readers of this, this letter, even though they were established, uh, but there was never a guarantee of that establishment that there would be, that they would always remember the truth. You know, it's almost like this. Without the written word, do you realize that Christianity is one generation from extinction? Without the written word, you know, I, I, without the Bible, we don't, we, you know, we're not dependent upon handing it down. For, have you ever played that, that game? What's it called? Gossip? With telephone, and you tell somebody something, and then they tell somebody something. I love playing that game with the kids because by the time kids love that game, we can do it right there in front of everybody around the table. I can actually hear Faith telling Malachi the original story, but by the time it gets around to me, it is garbage. It's not even close to the original. But with the Word of God, we have it. We have the Scriptures. Peter knew that he was going to die, and he wanted to leave something behind. He tells him, you're established, but I want to leave something behind that will never die, the written word of God. Even though I'm going to die, the written word of God will never die. Cherry and I were talking about the history of our, our church plants. And one of the things that's been, uh, you know, that's been kind of interesting, and I love to lead this way. I love to lead a church in such a way that if I'm killed in a car accident or a bus, a church gets sick of me and shoots me, I have left, hopefully, a church that just continues to go on. Because it's not grounded or founded in anything I've said. It's grounded and founded on the Lord Jesus Christ and built upon the Word of God. I always have this five, I call it the five gallon bucket challenge. You fill a five gallon bucket full of water, you thrust your hand down in the middle of it. Now you may slosh a little water out. You may get a little water on the, on the sidewalk, it may be a little stained, but it'll dry up eventually. But then you pull your hand out, and the hole that's left is how much you're going to be missed when you're gone. It's a sad truth of reality. You think, man, I need so much for that job. Really? Really? <laughs> Not to knock on Todd, but I used to be able, about three years ago, I'd say, you guys know Todd at the station station? They'd go, yeah, I know Todd. I work with Todd. Now it's getting around me. So these guys go, no, I've never heard of it. <laughs> That's not necessarily true because he's infamous. But... They don't always say, well, you know the guy that crashed the engine into the police car? Oh, yeah, I know Todd. <clears throat> but that is the truth in this, even in this church, that is the truth that even in everything. Peter knew this. Man will die, but the word of God lives forever. The church of Jesus Christ is always one generation from extinction. And that's why we are so dependable, dependent on the written revelation. We are so dependent upon the word of God, not mouth to mouth. But literally, let's read the scripture together. The main thing I want to teach my children is first, come to knowledge of Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to teach my 
children is turn to the Word of God every single day with their daily feed. Number two, your experiences will fade, but the Word of God remains. Listen to this. He, I love this text. Uh, this is a, this is what Peter's doing here. Is he's reliving the, the, the he's reliving the transfiguration, and he says, "For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty." Now he's sitting there thinking, "Man, I remember that day." For when we receive, when we, he received honor and glory from God the Father, a voice came to him from the majestic glory. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. And we heard this voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. See, Peter's not going, hey, this is just some secondhand information. This is not just some Greek. You, 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 have to, you, you kind of have to get it. The focus of this is on the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. This experience is recorded. If you want to write me, write me say it's Matthew 17. Um, it's Mark 9. And it's also in Luke, Luke 9, 28 through 36. He says, but you know, these writers, like I say, none of them were actually there. It was Peter who gave them the actual experience. Peter, James, and John. <coughs> Here's what I believe is the three, here's the three, three purposes of the transfiguration. Number one, it confirms Peter's testimony about Jesus Christ. Think about it for a second. Jesus was born like every other human baby. You look at that little baby back there. Sweet. He's as powerless as he can be. He's dependent completely and utterly on mommy and daddy. That little baby back in the back. Depend, dependent completely and utterly on mommy and daddy. Utterly dependent. But when Peter sees Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he sees Peter in his majesty. And in his glory. And he sees a picture of the kingdom of God. It's greatness. When you see, when Peter looks at Jesus and the Mount of Transfiguration, he sees absolutely zero need for anything. He's above need. He's above pain. He's above everything. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-glorious, majestic. So it gives weight to, G to Peter's testimony about Jesus Christ. The second purpose is, it's a, is, is I, it is really, I believe this, is it's, can you imagine being Jesus? He's at the moment where he's about to go and be crucified. What does the Mount of tr Transfiguration do for the humanity of Christ? You know, he's had been trailed for three years by the Jews. That's the way they refer to them. He's been threatened. He's been threatened to be killed. He's been persecuted. And he's about to be ultimately sacrificed on the cross. This moment has to bring and fuse and, and this, this transfiguration was, 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 was giving Jesus the strength and the power to endure to the end. The transfiguration was proof that suffering also leads to glory when we are in the will of God. Now, see, this is the thing. I, I, I love how we, just, we kind of, we kind of uh, work through what suffering really is, okay? Um, we can't pay the electricity bill because 
we went and spent the money on pleasure. We're suffering. No, we're not. What we are doing is we're reaping the consequences of stupidity in the area of stewardship. Suffering, and the suffering that we're talking about for here, is this. My life and my purpose is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the masses. And when the masses reject it and they take that out on me, that's suffering. I live right at my work. And when my boss comes to me and says, you will do this, this, and this in order to cheat somebody, and I say absolutely not because that will violate the God that I worship, the God that I've created to follow. I will not do it. And that boss goes, guess what? You're fired. That's suffering. Transfiguration is proof that suffering leads to glory when we are in the will of God. You gotta start, you gotta underline that last part. Not because we're living stupid, we're asking for it. I'm driving down I-95 at 79.5 miles an hour, and the highway patrol pulls me over. I'm not suffering. I'm paying the price for speeding and the consequences. I was driving down Orange Avenue one day. I was going to somewhere and I had my mind on something else. And, and I looked and I see the police officer hit his lights. And I look down and I go, oh my goodness, I was doing, I don't remember, I think it was like almost 50 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. And he pulls me over. He walks up to the car and he goes, do you know how fast you're going? I said, you know what? No, I did not. I said, I had no clue. I said, I wasn't even paying attention to nothing I was doing. I said, I was, my mind was a million miles. I wasn't even in this car. And he goes, I said, I, I didn't realize how fast I was going once I saw your lights turn on. I looked down and I saw. And he goes, you were like two miles an hour from criminal. And I said, I probably was. I said, I said, I'm not. I said honestly, I said, thank God I thought about putting my seatbelt on. He just looks at me. And he goes, okay, well, and he comes back and goes, I'm going to write you a warning. And I go, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I deserve a ticket. He goes, oh, I know you deserve a ticket. He goes, you almost deserve one in jail. And I said, you're right, sir. I said, I'll pay better attention next time. What was I going to do? Lie? I did that in the past. But what I didn't want is a ticket and the guilt of lying at the same time. I would rather get a ticket and know that I told you. See, guys, we are not suffering when we're, we're owning up to what we've done wrong. We are only suffering when we have done right. And we've done the will of God. And those who we've done that to do not, they resist the will of God. They do not look to the will of God as their guide of lives. The transfiguration shows that glory comes from suffering. Number two, three, that last thing is there's a third message. And it has to do with this, and that's the promise of the kingdom. Peter, we didn't. Now, some of you may be old enough to have witnessed the transfiguration. You just happened to not be there at the time it happened. That was going to be a joke. <laughs> but we can take Peter's eyewitness account, and we can trust. And his eyewitness account as being truth. One, he was willing to suffer and die for it. And you see, you know, it's kind of an interesting time in which we live in because movies and, and CG and, and, and all of this stuff has given us the opportunity to recreate anything we want. Like this Percy Jackson movie series that he goes on. Man, they can make a guy walk around. What do they call those guys with the horse legs? Huh? Centaur? Minotaur. Minotaur. He would have looked goofy in the 50s in black and white. That just wouldn't have worked. And see, now we're seeing Greek mythology. And Roman demigods. 
and things being shown on television like they're true. I was watching one of the last Percy Jackson ones, and this guy, uh, he made Zeus mad, I guess, and every time he poured wine, Zeus would turn his wine into water. And then, and, and the guy makes this reference. He goes, now the Christians, they have a God who can do the opposite. You better, I mean, hopefully there's two things, that, there's two phases of what you're, you're operating in. Hopefully you come to the point where you're like these readers, they're established in the faith. You know that you know that you're a Christ follower. Hopefully you have come to a saving knowledge that Jesus Christ is your, is your Lord and Savior. If you haven't, that's a whole other issue. But hopefully, if you have, you're establishing your life day in, day out on the promises of the truth of the gospel of Christ. The, the preachings, the teachings. See, the Greek and Roman world abounded in stories of all their gods and hypothetical concepts of how the worlds began, where it was just mere human speculation on, 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 on the world and its origin. No matter how interesting, no matter how cool these stories are on, on, on the big screen, they're myth. Jesus' transfiguration hands down to us an eyewitness account. An eyewitness account of the glory and majesty of the true kingdom of God. That transfiguration, Peter saw Jesus in his glory. He saw Moses and Elijah attesting to that glory. And he heard from heaven the voice of the one only God say, This is my son. And he witnessed it. Is Jesus now the master, the Son of God? And Peter answers that question. Yes, he is. How do I know? Because I heard the God of heaven say he was. See, I love that. It is so powerful because our, our what do you say to have faith? What? Yeah. 
you're going to have some peanuts, you're going to drink that, and then you're going to come. This is how it works on the airline. They go, here's your peanuts, here's your peanuts. Thank you, we'll take those. We're landing. That's transportation today. Transportation. My friend, in two, uh, two weeks after, or a week or so after we get back, is going to South Africa. They'll be there, and they're, they're going to complain, and I guarantee they will. There'll be people who complain. That travel was at least 28 hours to South Africa. Adonai and Judson took that same trip, and it was over six months. And people died on the trip, or got sick, and never recovered. Communication. This message will go on the internet and has the opportunity of reaching more people than the apostles could have ever reached with the gospel of Christ preaching. In years. But you know what? The human heart is still wicked. And all of our improvements, it means that we, you know what? It doesn't mean that we have improved lives. With all these improvements, medical science enables people to live longer, but there is no guarantee they will live better. Just longer. Trans or communication means that not only that we, it, 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 it enables us to communicate, but it, we can communicate filth. Planes and, it, it, it enables us to travel places faster. But it doesn't guarantee that what we do when we get there will be better. Our world is still engulfed and will continue to get darker because of our spiritual darkness. But the light of Christ, the gospel, will continue to burn brighter and brighter in a darker, darker world. Man, I turn on my little LED flashlight in Port St. Lucie, it's okay. When I turn my little LED flashlight on in Haiti, it's like I just lit up the entire neighborhood. Because all the electricity in that town is off, and everywhere you look is dark. And it becomes so much more bright. See, let me go through these last three things. In verse 19, what we find is the Word of God is confirmed. The transfiguration, he goes, so we have the prophetic Word strongly confirmed. It also confirms the truth of His Word. The promise of the kingdom is not only confirmed by God, it's confirmed by Moses, and it's confirmed by Elijah. It, it, it is confirmed. I mean, it's the Son, the Father, and Elijah and Moses. Everyone's confirming. And the Holy Spirit wrote the record for the church to read. God's word shines in darkness. We have in verse the the B portion of 19. He says, you will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal place. Man, I'm a Lord of the Rings freak. I love those movies. And one of the, my favorite scenes is this, the cave spider scene when all Frodo has left is that light. His friends are all gone. He's even run off his best friend. His enemy has departed from him and left him with nothing but the spider. And he's got that life. Tolkien is making a, I mean, I'm telling you, that is a, it is a, 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 a picture, a metaphor for the Word of God in the darkness of your life. And that spider's about to attack you, man. 
You've got the Word of God. It's murky, it's dismal, and it's dark. Do you know in the, in the, in the beginning we have a garden of Eden? It's bright, it's beautiful, it's, it's exotic, it's killer. But by the time we get to now, it's murky as a swamp. We, go, we went from bright and beautiful in the garden of Eden to murky and dark and terrible in the swamp. I love the, the psalmist in 119.05. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Lastly, God's word comes from God's spirit. Listen to this. First of all, you should know this. No prophecy of scripture comes from one's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, it says, moved by the spirit, men spoke from God. If you're in small group this week, I've got the last, the last discussion question. Or you might, you might talk amongst this. I'll put them inside your outline too. You can talk about this in your own. What does it mean by inspiration? What does it mean that the scriptures are inspired? It is time to wake up. It's time for me to wake up. You know, there's been many times I look over the span of my ministry, and there's times that I just was like asleep. Lulled to sleep, worn out, tired. <coughs> something happened, attack, or I, something spiritual, something just physical, something, you know, relational. Now I went to pieces. I see that in my own personal life, and I know it exists in your life. You want to guard yourself against falseness, darkness. You want to guard your family against darkness. In your hand, you have all you'll ever need if you use it. But I'm telling you, sitting on the coffee table, white with a family Bible written on the cover of it, is it going to make it? Going to church on Sunday morning, as much as, much as I enjoy that, as much as I celebrate that, it ain't going to cut it. You're going to have to learn to take the Word of God and you're going to have to learn to eat it Digest it, consume it every single day of your life. Studying it, memorizing it, stu stu uh, reading it, just consuming it, applying it. Or you will join the countless others who have been lulled asleep carried away by fable, pushed into the bitterness, moved on into nominalism. Who cares? That's boring. When I was first in seminary, I preached a message. And I was going to actually tell the story at the beginning of the service as a joke. But God has impressed me to move it to the end. I went and I preached in one of my first churches. I, I can't, I can't uh, attest to the fact that the message was all that interesting because I was, I was pretty new. But I will tell the truth. 
we were in a little old church. And this old boy was sitting right where you were kind of sitting there. Rob. And I got it, and I noticed him I kind of as I'm preaching, he got up and went to the back and turned the air conditioner down where it was really cool. This is right at the beginning of the message. And he came and he sat right down there and proceeded to go to sleep. Me being pretty fiery back in those days, I I, I mellowed so much nowadays. I would left that that uh, stage as I'm still preaching. I've got you know wireless and I hooked up and I walked right down to where that guy was sitting in his chair. And I stood right beside his head like this. He's sitting here and he's still snoozing. He's snoozing, I can hear him. And I said, This church, and I've worked it into my message, I don't know how, but I went, he's gonna have to wake up. And when he did, his arms went straight out. His legs went straight out that way. And you would have thought I hit him in the back of the head. See, I can do that physically. I can do that physically. But that is not my job. And it is not my intention with this message to do that spiritually. That's not me. It's not my job. That belongs to God. That belongs to the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin, and righteousness, and judgment. I'm just a paper boy. I throw the newspaper up on your doorstep. It is up to you to read it and heed it. Amen?